Okay, um, if you can get everybody to sit down, um, that would be great. Um, so we're going to start the, uh, the very next um, session on uh, sort of Spark Streaming on Cassandra um, with two guys, two excellent gentlemen from DataStax, and they promised me they're going to play good cop and bad cop. Um, they're going to introduce themselves. Good afternoon. All right. And you're Good afternoon. I'm Al Toby from DataStax. I am an open source evangelist for Apache Cassandra. And I'm Tupshin Harper from DataStax. Uh, no, neither of us from, are from Databricks, sadly, though the confusion may be obvious. Uh, we come from the uh, operational database side of things, um, not the analytics side. We've long incorporated analytics technology into our overall stack, uh, DataStax Enterprise. Uh, and many people have done lots of analytics uh, along with Cassandra, the open source technology that we champion. But uh, we're here to talk about uh, how Spark and Cassandra integrate. You might have heard our uh, VP of Engineering, Martin, talk this morning. We, we announced our integration both commercially and open source this morning. Uh, we're here to talk about how that applies to the immediacy necessary for the Internet of Technologies. So, with the age of connectedness, everything is getting connected these days. We, you know, that's what is powering a lot of the uh, economic changes, the technical changes, uh, it's driving almost everything that, uh, that changes in my daily life, at least. But it's also the age of disconnectedness. We uh, have constant network interruptions, uh, volatility in the, uh, in the you know, latencies. The, uh, predictability can't really happen when you're talking about spanning you know, continents, when you're talking about uh, moving data all over the place, and we're talking about doing it at uh, giant scale and, and great volume, which is where we tend to focus our efforts. It's the age of wisdom, the CAP theorem that really goes to the heart of what we do. You know, it, it talks about the fundamental trade-offs between things like consistency and availability. For us, availability is absolutely key. We focus on that you know, above pretty much everything else. That means that uh, we do f uh, focus on eventual consistency. We make sure that once you uh, write your data into our uh, operational database, it will uh, eventually get to the point and place that you need it to. In practice, that's typically milliseconds or less. But uh, architecturally, it means that we have no single point of failure, and, well, all right, cheap shot, but, uh, <laughs> you know, everybody loves them, everybody likes to knock them, <laughs> but we, it, we, we do stand in stark contrast to them in terms of our uh, choice of availability over uh, a single point of failure, which many stacks, uh, the vast majority, uh, have. There's also a lot of complexity uh, in both the Mongo world and the Hadoop world. I'm not a big fan of complexity. It, it, it makes... Uh, really hard to solve uh, the problems that uh, we need to solve operationally. So with DataStax Enterprise and uh, Cassandra, we you know, took the notion of a complex Hadoop stack, integrated into the Cassandra stack, and said, all right, you can just spin up a Cassandra and Hadoop analytics cluster, or, or data center in this case, side by side, or in another physical location, your, uh, your operational data store managing your data that, as it goes in and out. What? All right, fine. So the Internet of Things is, honestly, it's everything at this point. Everything that gets connected is following the same pattern. It's generating events. It's uh, needing to be analyzed. It's needing to be analyzed in real time in order to compete with, uh, with anybody uh, uh, in your sector. So the immediacy uh, of the connectedness is, is what's really striking about the entire Internet of Things uh, industry. So really, what is it, though? It's connecting. And it's actually, it, it's not new. It predates the World Wide Web. The first uh, you know, toaster was, a, or I think it was a toaster, was connected to the internet about a year before uh, the web ever existed. Shouldn't be surprising to anybody at this point, uh, but uh, the scale of it, you know, people are predicting 20 billion connected items within you know, less than a decade from now. But it's not old news either. It's a rapidly changing thing right now. Care to talk about any use cases? Oh, yeah. So the Internet of Things is something we've, we heard about many years ago, and it's kind of hard to get excited about today because the hype that we heard in the, in the Audis um, didn't really materialize. We, th we kept hearing, well, your refrigerator is going to be connected, and your washer and dryer, and you're not going to have to order groceries anymore because your refrigerator will know. And that all turned out to be just a bunch of bull. Um, <laughs> and finally, finally, the, the technology available to us is starting to catch up to our dreams is kind of the way that I see it. We have my favorite database, Apache Cassandra, that can span multiple geographies 
provide the ability to have global load balancing, have global data centers, and have one single view of your data, and have the, already have the database handle that for you. So now we have Fitbits. We've got the Nest. We've got our cars that are actually connected to 4G all the time. Um, industrial equipment, medical devices. you got various sensors that are everywhere these days. Environmental sensors. You've got vibration sensors and bridges and just crazy stuff everywhere. Um, and where we're heading is you know, a future where everything's connected and we can start to achieve new ways of balancing load like traffic load and electric, electrical grid is kind of my favorite one. Um, if we have smart meters everywhere, we can actually start to use some of this technology like Spark and machine learning to predict spikes in the power grid and balance traffic accordingly. Oops. So uh, to actually do address that last slide. So the Internet of Things, not just hype. It's very real and happening right now uh, all around us. And frankly, there's a lot of opportunity in almost every sector related to it. So, but this is really just what we've been doing. Whether it's you call it Internet of Things, or whether you, whether you call it managing you know, fleets of trucks uh, uh, around the country, or, or managing uh, interactive applications and the, the click, you know, stream of clicks that uh, those represent, that's all what Cassandra has been doing for years. And, uh, and as we've been scaling it out to you know, thousands of nodes, uh, you know, you know, millions of operations per second, that's uh, really where the, the scale of Internet uh, of Things demands uh, a database that's both uh, highly available like Cassandra as well as uh, able to span both the geographies and all the locations that you need uh, Cassandra to be. So just quickly uh, for Cassandra, how many people here are running Cassandra in production? How many people are messing with it in the lab? Awesome. How many people are going to mess with it in the lab soon? More, more. <laughs> Thank you. So Cassandra's got actually a pretty long heritage going back to it, the D Amazon Dynamo paper and the, the Google Big Table papers. Um, the simplest way to describe it is that they had a love child, um, and that's Cassandra, in that the data model comes from the Big Table lineage, the availability model, model comes from Dynamo. So there's no single point of failure. Every node is equal. When you install it, there's one node type that you install. So what is Cassandra? It's chocolate. What do, I, what do I mean by that? Well, we'll get to that. Well, we're at a Spark conference. I'm not going to spend much time talking about what Spark is, but it's very, very important to me uh, personally, and, uh, and that's as a company. Uh, but just briefly, so, you know, Spark to me is a better Hadoop, certainly. It's better because it do, it's not limited by the same you know, MapReduce paradigm. Uh, it's better because it uh, certainly takes far better advantage of caching and has uh, fundamentally better underpinnings. Um, it adopts much of the eco uh, Hadoop ecosystem, but it's really not dependent on it. Uh, you don't have to have any of the you know, typical components of uh, Hadoop. Uh, as we've demonstrated with our uh, open source driver today uh, uh, that was uh, announced this morning and is uh, available on GitHub today, is that you can uh, fire up uh, a Spark instance, talk to a Cassandra node, talk to a thousand node uh, Cassandra cluster, and be able to interact with it transparently. You can you know, persist RDDs, you can uh, 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 do queries against it using either, in our case, Shark or uh, uh, Scala. You can, uh, uh, to be uh, uh, coming up soon is our, uh, with our 1.0 integration, which we're working on now, will be a uh, full integration of the Spark SQL, which was really, really fascinating talk that we just heard. Um, we are very, very excited about Spark, to say the least. The streaming side of things is the most important to me, though. So it's the immediacy of that information I was talking about before with uh, Internet of Things. You know, it's not going to help you much if you know that your oh, house is burning down 10 minutes ago. Not a good idea uh, to rely on that. All right, that's maybe a contrived example, but the more and more uh, these uh, sensors are needing to be reacted to, these devices are needing to be uh, interoperated with, and they're needing to, need to be interoperated with at scale. Uh, some things that you can do um, with that uh, 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 in a batch processing mode, things like you know, machine learning, uh, statistical analysis, uh, clustering algorithms, all of those things uh, have been used on top of Cassandra data sets, maybe with Mahout or uh, you know, other uh, similar technologies, uh, but they've been used overnight, typically, or, or at least in long batch mode. Uh, what you know, things like uh, Spark Streaming are bringing to us is the ability to do, make that a, an inbound pipeline uh, of, of processing, a data enrichment, uh, and, um, 
and manipulation such that you can actually get immediate answers and, and trigger immediate action out of uh, that pipeline. So to me, Sparks is the peanut butter to Cassandra's chocolate. There's your punchline. Can you take that away? Hmm? <laughs> so we have a database available to us now that can do a million writes a second. And maybe you have an application that's taking a million writes a second. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to go and write it into the database and then run a batch job. To what we're really excited about, especially in terms of IoT, is being able to process the events as they arrive before you write them to the data store and write both the raw data and the aggregates to the data store in real time. You're going to do the same amount of processing or likely very much less. And Spark Streaming provides us a nice framework for being able to build these ingest systems without having to build it from scratch every time. How many people have built an ingest system from scratch? How many people love doing it? <laughs> right, it's a, it's a huge pain. It has a lot of problems that you have to solve in terms of availability and data resilience. What happens when it fails? Do I lose events? Are they gonna be delivered or not? And Spark Streaming actually provides a lot of the primitives that you need to build an ingest system without having to invent all these things yourself. So, you know, it's uh, Cassandra, we've, what we've been talking about it as a highly scalable database. Wow. Uh, Cassandra's a highly scalable database, and uh, Netflix was one of our mo first and most prominent users of that database. They fairly uh, prominently uh, made the early claim that you could scale uh, Cassandra up linearly, add more nodes, and, uh, and your throughput increases uh, proportionally to it. They didn't just, you know, well, Cassandra had been making that claim. Netflix really uh, proved it out. They demonstrated that you know, as they scaled up to 100, 200, 300 nodes uh, in the cloud on EC2, that they could get that linear increase. Very few databases on the planet uh, are able to make that claim even today. Um, but then, you know, to go along with that uh, scale, you need to gather meaning. Uh, and Cassandra has not been very good at that, frankly. It's a fairly dumb get data in, get data out kind of system. Uh, it doesn't have, you know, well, only recently added triggers, which aren't uh, too widely used. It doesn't have a lot in the way of uh, a transformation of data or data manipulation capabilities. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we've done the integration with Hadoop and other technologies in the past. Spark, again, though, makes that immediate. It makes the batch processing much faster. That's great. Uh, we, we absolutely need that. But much more importantly to me, it makes the inbound ingestion pipeline possible to get real meaning out of that data while still operating on top of your operational database. So the dream is, right, we want to be able to have dashboards for all of our devices where you can go from your phone and have an app or an HTML5 application and see these things stream by in real time. When it's built in a batch system, you know, I've worked on Hadoop systems that have gotten as quick, as fast, ultra fast as 20 minutes per batch, um, which that's, joke actually <laughs> um, you know 20 minutes per batch is pretty fast for Hadoop um, you know and where we want to be is sub second and we want to be at five second 30 second batches kind of more of a micro batch style which is what spark stream may actually provides and then be able to provide these drill downs and these aggregates in real time because they're being built up in, in memory in RDDs you can actually now start to be able to flush these out to a Cassandra or you can actually start to do reads directly through spark SQL at some point um, and then, you know, kind of the most popular question I get actually from the user community as an evangelist is, hey man, how do I do top K with Cassandra? And my question is always, well, you can go write a ma distributed MapReduce job and then, you know, if you've seen the comic, you know what the re result is, right? <laughs> Did you just tell me to go have fun with myself? Um, so this is kind of really exciting for us because now when customers come and ask us these questions, we can say, hey, we have Spark Streaming, we've got Spark, we got two different ways to access your data in ver with very low latency. So we've talked a lot about um, getting information in and transforming it as it comes in, but it's really important to be able to take action as well. Uh, it doesn't help your, uh, your, uh, your users, your customers, the people actually paying you money if you get that information late. So uh, it's not just the processing, but also taking action in the inbound pipeline. So as Al was mentioning, you know, we, we, uh, within the Spark streaming 
uh, layer, you can both write down to Cassandra and then perform other actions. Uh, in this case, it could be sending off an actor, uh, ACA actor message to another you know, uh, application in your uh, cluster. It could be you know, firing off a message to a distributed event queue. Um, it could be firing off an alert to alert customer service of a problem. Whatever it is, it, it allows you to get that immediate, immediate information. Um, one of the reasons why we uh, wrote the uh, Cassandra uh, Spark integration the way we did, uh, using our uh, built-in you know, Java JVM uh, driver, uh, is because it gives you that fine-grained access. You can write individual uh, rows as RDDs as they come in down to Cassandra. You can uh, retrieve individual elements from Cassandra, but you can also do the full-scale um, uh, uh, pipeline processing or, or batch processing as well over the entire data set. Uh, the flexibility is, is quite powerful, and the integration is both, both powerful but very separate. We're not forking Spark. We're not making any modifications to Spark. Um, and we're just using uh, 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 Spark as a way to get, uh, to manipulate the data within Cassandra in a way that Cassandra never could. Architecturally, you wanna, okay. So one of the things that I've been working really hard on in terms of working with our community is the new architecture for kind of these massive scale applications that we're all working on. Um, and this is kind of the, the most, the primitive that I wanna see more of us using in that we don't have these funnels that we used to deal with. You know, there's, a there's always a database at the bottom somewhere, right? Or there's a SAN or some shared piece of infrastructure that is inevitably going to blow up and ruin your weekend. Um, and, you know, I spent 15 years in operations, and that's not what I want to do anymore. I want, I want my infrastructure to withstand failures. And this is kind of the first pass at kind of what we want to see is these new architectures. You can have the two clouds on the outside of this diagram represent just different parts of the internet. They could be your Amsterdam area and Amsterdam data center and your US East one data center. Now it's actually split it out, <laughs> but you, your clients basically accessing. Now you have Spark running in both of those data centers on top of a Cassandra that's geo replicated. You have Spark streaming processing events as they come in, creating aggregates, writing those in, and those get replicated across data centers in a full nasty ma master master write. With, with whatever kind of replication topology you want. You could have a dozen data centers, and you could have one set of your data, a key space, replicate to five of them, and the uh, other replicate to you know, nine of them. You have the uh, very fine-grained uh, ca uh, capability to control uh, where your data is uh, managed while you're still moving it around uh, and ingesting it rapidly through you know, either our native CQL driver or else through Spark. The key thing to realize is that you can write anywhere as long as you've got the replication enabled, and now so all of a sudden these things that you had to think really hard about, how do I localize my users? How do I make sure that users are joined to one cluster and shard them across different geographies? It's a huge pain, especially with the way that CDNs and GSLB DNS work. And now it all works so that these two systems work together to make your application a lot less complex. So. And there we have it. Uh, any questions? Any time for questions? Oh, I should, m one plug. So look for two different accounts on GitHub, both Datastax, where the uh, open source driver that we just mentioned is, as well as Datastax code samples, which has some ex existing uh, integrations between Spark and Cassandra, and there'll be uh, more there coming soon. What? Your streaming code is also? It, that one will be made public probably tomorrow. But yes, there are multiple existing examples there. All right, thank, thank you very you. much.